Welcome once again, this is Pinnacle Professional College. And today we bring you another lecture on advanced audits and assurance. As part of preparing for the exam, we'll be going through some past questions to understand you know, how to answer questions properly and you know, basically see how best we can approach and improve um, our question answering process. Now on the first page of this paper, we are told that the standard of the paper was reasonably high. The questions were well within the syllabus. However, the candidate's performance went so great. Um, so candidate's performance was abysmal considering performances in previous sittings. Right? This is in May, 2021. So we are looking specifically at the May, 2021 exam. So it appears some candidates did not take time to understand the requirements of the questions. Reading through the scripts, it emerged that the candidate did individual work with no sign of copy work, as no two answers appeared the same. So we can see clearly from this that um, May 2021, those who sat during that time for advanced audits didn't do too well on the exam. Um, so we'll go through the questions and see how best to approach it. So question one, a fundamental principles require that a member of a professional accountancy body behave with integrity in all business, in all professional business and financial relationships and strive for objectivity in all professional and business judgments. Objectivity can only be measured if the member is seen to be independent. Conflicts of interest have an essential bearing on independence and the public's perception of the accounting profession's integrity, objectivity, and independence, right? So the following scenario is a press report on a multinational firm of accountants. The regulatory body directed a partner in a firm that he must resign because he was in breach of the regulatory body's independence rules. His brother-in-law was the financial controller of an audit client. He was informed that the alternative was for him to move his home and place of work at least 400 miles from the client's office, even though he was not the reporting partner. This made his job untenable. The accounting firm saw the regulatory body as taking its rules to absurd lengths. Shortly after this comment, the multinational firm announced proposal to split the firm into the following areas audit tax, tax and business advisory services, management consultancy, and investment advisory services. So, that's this the preamble to the question. Now, it's always important to read the preamble because they give you context and clarity around the question, right? So, obviously, independence objectivity, conflict of interest um, are very, very important here. So I'm, I'm expecting questions around that. So required, in relation to integrity, objectivity, and independence, discuss the impact the above events may have on the public perception of the multinational firm of accountants. Mm, that's interesting. So first of all, how I'll approach this question is, I'll try and explain what integrity is what objectivity is and what independence is, right? right? So what is integrity? Integrity is truthfulness in action and character. That's integrity, right? What's objectivity? Objectivity, you know, objectivity and integrity, they seem to be somewhat related, but I'm giving my brief thoughts on it before, you know, I even delve into the details. Right. When we say objectivity, what do we mean? When we say objectivity, what do we mean? Objectivity simply means honesty. Right. Honesty. So when we when we say someone is objective, um, we basically mean that the person is not just honest. Maybe honest is not the right word, but the person is impartial. That's the word I wanted. Impartial. So that's objectivity, impartiality. That's objectivity. And then what is independence? 
what is independence? Now, one of the key things when it comes to audits is auditor independence. It's auditor independence. Independence is very, very important because um, to be able to understand independence, um, you are literally understanding one of the core principles of auditing, of auditing. So let's look at a, a little bit about auditor independence, right? When we say independence, we basically mean that auditors, right, can carry out their work in a very objective and free manner without any influences, right? In other words, this is a simple way I'm explaining it. In other words, when we say auditor independence, um, when, in other words, when you say auditor independence, you're simply talking about um, the ability for the auditor to act very impartial, uninfluenced way in relation to the examination of the financial statements. What we mean by auditor independence. Now, the reason why it is called independence is it means that when somebody is independent, it means that they are free from any external influences, right? When a country becomes independent, it means that they are free from colonization. They are free from an external force. So the auditor must have a free hand in you know, assessing the financial statements. And this is characterized by integrity and objectivity, right? So the perception of independence is very, very crucial. Right. But when we talk about independence, we have to know that the auditor must be independent and must also be seen to be independent. Right. So the auditor being independent is not only it's not only enough. The auditor must be perceived or seen to be independent. Right. It's very, very important. Very, very important. I, I hope you get the point. So it's one thing to be independent, another thing to be seen to, ind to be independent. It's one thing to be truthful, it's another thing to be seen to be truthful. So one deals with the individual, the other deals with you know, external people, right? So the reputation of the auditor is important when it comes to independence. So as we all know, independence is at the heart of every you know, it's, it's at the heart of the profession, the auditing profession, right? And when an auditor is independent, it means that they are able to give an impartial, objective opinion, right? Just imagine if an auditor is not independent, if it's not free, if the auditor is influenced by someone, has been <laughs> bribed by someone, how can they give an objective and impartial opinion, right? So if the auditor is not independent, they cannot act with integrity, they cannot be objective. So these three principles act are tied in a way. So integrity, objectivity, and independence are related, right? Because it's important for the auditor to give an opinion on the truth and fairness on the financial statements. They're supposed to give, you know, the opinion and that opinion has to be objective. And that opinion has to be impartial. That opinion must come with integrity on the truth and fairness of the financial statements. Very, very important but it has to come from an auditor who has a free hand to do his work, right? Who is independent, independent. So let me explain what's independence again. Let me explain what's independence again, is again. So when we say independence, it means that the auditor does not have any financial or other form of interest in the firm they are auditing or they are not influenced by any external parties when it comes to their audits, right? And that's very, very important. That's very, very important because sometimes clients can give you pressure. The clients you are auditing can give you pressure and can sway you in a certain direction uh, where you would not act with integrity when presenting or auditing or examining the financial statements. So if you are independent, you have a free hand. The auditor has a free hand to do their work. Now, 
let's go into detail a little bit, right? Let's go into detail a little bit. Um, one of the things you should know is that when you pick the when you pick the concept of objectivity and integrity, right? One of the things you know is that there are several things that are what we call threats to auditor independence. I'm sure as you have gone through the text, you would threats to auditor independence. Threats to auditor independence. Now, these threats are very, very important to know. These threats are very, very important to know. These threats are very, very important to know. So let's look at some of the, let's look at some of the threats. Let's look at some of the threats. Now, I'm sure you've seen some of these threats while you are going through the text, but number one, right? Let me mention some of them. So number one threat is what we call um, the self-interest threats. The self-interest threats. The self-interest threats. Right? That's number one. The self-interest threats. That's number one. So what's self-interest threats? It's basically where the auditor has a financial interest in the company, right? If the auditor has the financial interest in the company, then that auditor is not independent, right? If I'm an auditor and have an interest in the company, for instance, I've bought shares in the company, how can I be independent? Cannot. So that's self-interest threats. Or when the auditor, you know, it depends on a client for a major fee that's outstanding, right? So that's self-interest threats. Then you have self-review threats. So a self-review threat is when the auditor is reviewing his own work. The auditor examines the financial statement, they assess the financial statement, and then they have to come and review their own work, right? It's like a student who writes an examination and marks his own paper. Right, that threatens independence. They also have the advocacy threats, right? The advocacy threats, when we say an advocate is a promoter, right? So an advocacy threat is, you know, when the auditor is involved in promoting the clients, you know, if the auditor has to promote the clients, then the objectivity may be compromised. Then you have the familiarity threats. It's when the auditor is too close or familiar with the client's company, right? The client's company. So take note of all these threats. And it's important to know them. There's also the intimidation threat, where the auditor is intimidated by management such that they cannot act objectively. It's very, very important. Very, very important. So um, this is something that, um, these are some threats that you need to know. So let's look at the relationship here. When you look at, um, you look at this case, you see that if you go up a little bit, you realize that um, it says his brother-in-law was the financial controller of an audit client. So you see that there's a family relationship between the auditor and the client, you know? So if there's a family relationship like, like that, it can affect the objectivity of the auditor, right? It can affect the objectivity of the auditor. So usually the advice that is given is that the auditor does not build any close personal relationships with other clients and should not even audit a client where there's a family member who is in a position where he has something to do with the accounts or the financial statements. Very, very important because that breeds familiarity. And we talked about one of the threats, which is the familiarity threat, right? So, so this is very, very important. This is very, very important. So we are told that 
there's some kind of family relationship here and that's going to breed familiarity and are going to affect or data independence. Right, so, but there's a caveat here. There's a caveat here. Usually family relationships between auditors and their clients can affect the objectivity of the auditor, right? But let's look in this instance particularly to see if, um, to see if the partner was the reporting partner for the audit clients. So it says the following scenario is a press report on a multinational firm of accountants. The regulatory body directed the partner in a firm and must resign because it was in breach of uh, regulatory body's independence rules. His brother-in-law was the financial controller of an audit client. Hmm. So um, this does not automatically affect auditor independence, right? We need to ask ourselves the question, was this partner the reporting partner for the audit clients where the audit clients who's um, the audit clients in which his brother-in-law was a finance controller. We need to ask ourselves that was this report, was, was this partner, the partner for that audit client that we are looking at? Because if it's not there, if the partner was not the partner for that audit clients where the brother-in-law was the financial controller, then there is really no compromise on independence here, right? So that was the principle. The principle of independence here is familiarity, right? And that if there's some kind of family relationship here, it can compromise independence. That's the key, right? So that's the principle. Then we need to go a step further and ask ourselves, you know, was there some kind of familiarity here? Yes, we do see the brother-in-law here who was the financial controller of an audit client. Okay, no problem. And now we need to go a step further to ask ourselves, the partner that has been accused here, did he audit this client where his brother-in-law was the financial controller? We need to ask ourselves that, right? In this case, it seemed that this partner had nothing to do with that audit client where his brother was you know, a financial controller, right? So that's a different situation. So the reporting partner here was not the reporting partner for the audit client in which his brother-in-law was the finance controller. According to, you know, basically ethics, right? Or the ethical practice. In this situation, the firm appears to be independent of the audit clients. The firm appears to be independent of the audit clients. And I'll put a caveat here. If this reporting partner did not have anything to do with the clients in question here, because it seems that they are not told that, you know, the partner had something to do with the audit clients here, where his brother was the finance, brother-in-law was the finance controller. We are not told that this partner was auditing that client. So if that partner did not have anything to do with the other clients, then the firm is independent in that sense. I hope that makes sense, right? So let me try and go through again. Number one, the principle here is independence. Um, what is the possible threat? The possible threat is familiarity. Um, what about familiarity? There seems to be some kind of family relationship here because there is the partner has a brother-in-law who is the financial controller of an audit client. We need to go a step further and ask ourselves, did this partner audit that particular client? From, from the text, it doesn't seem like, right? So if it doesn't seem like that, then it means that the firm is independent. If he did audit it, audit that client, then he's not independent. But from the text, it doesn't seem like he audited the client. So the firm is independent. I hope that makes sense. Okay, so how do you, how do we look at, um, let's let's go on to the question again. So that this is how you approach audit questions, right? So, so 
Um, he says, discuss the impact the above events may have on public perception of the multinational firm, right? So another area we need to talk about is independence in appearance. Now, I said that independence is in two ways, right? Number one is the auditor must be independent. They must also appear or be seen as independent. In this case, even though the auditor is independent because it doesn't look like the reporting partner had anything to do with the audit clients. He did not audit that client where his brother-in-law was the financial controller. But in terms of independence and appearance, that's a different thing, right? That's a different thing. Independence and appearance is what the public is perceiving, what outsiders are perceiving. So, um, very, very important. Um, very, very important. The, so, we are measuring two things here. We are measuring independence on the auditor side and independence from the public side. Both must come together. So, in this situation, the regulatory body, you know, what would not perceive the distinction between the partner, between a, a normal partner, right, and a partner who reports on a specific engagement, right? Because in this case, the public would view this as not, would view the partner as not being independent. Right? Even though technically the partner did not audit that client. So it's a case of how the regulatory body and the public would view this, right? Very, very important. Very, very important. So this is something that you should always note. This is something that you should always note. This is something that you should always note. And this is what we call independence in fact and independence in appearance. I'm sure you've seen this in your notes. So I don't go, I don't need to go into it into details with this. So independence in fact is where the auditor is actually independent. And independence is in appearance is what the public perceives. Right. So, so very, very important. Very, very important. So in this situation, the regulatory body to be concerned that you know, the public will not perceive the distinction between a partner and a partner who reports on a specific engagement, right? So as for the public, and they will not think about the fact that this partner did not audit these clients. You know, they still see it the same way. They still see it the same way. So that is very, very important. So independence, in fact, it looks like the auditor is independent here. Independence in appearance, that's a different case. The public might not see them as independent. Right. So now let's talk a little bit of how they resolve the situation, how they resolve the situation. So what the regulatory body did here was to require the auditor to move 400 miles. Right. So very, very, it's very, very interesting why they told them to, to do so. Right. So if you look in the context again, it says that let's look at this very, very carefully again. It says his he was informed that the alternative was for him to move his home and place of work at least 400 miles from the client's office, even though he was not the reporting partner. So you see, this guy was not the reporting partner. A reporting partner is the one who audits a particular client. So he was not the, uh, the reporting partner. So, so that's, um, that's very, very interesting, you know. But what do you think about this resolution? What do you think about this resolution? So the partner here was requested to change offices within the firm, right? He was requested to change offices within the firm, right? Within the firm. So 
I don't think really think this really solved the problem in a very good way. Because even though he changes offices, he still can have influence over an audit that is carried out in another territory. So a physical movement of an a partner from one audit to from one territory to another does not necessarily change anything in terms of independence because they could still have influence on this, they can still be influenced when it comes to audits, right? So the resolution has a question mark around it, right? Um, shortly after this comment, the multinational firm announced proposal to split the firm into follow the following areas, right? So we are being told that the multinational firm has now split the firm into these areas. Now, um, this is very, very important. This is very, very important because this could enhance the public's perception about this um, multinational firm, right? Because, you know, especially when it comes to the independence of the audit department, right? It could enhance the public's perception. Very, very, very key. Very, very key. And then, because the split shows some form of commitment, right? Some form of um, commitment there to ensure that things are in order. So it certainly or most likely can enhance the perception of the multinational firm and their independence, um, of the firm and their independence of the audit department. It's very, very important. Very, very important. So, so um, these are some key things I'll touch on when it comes to question number one A. So question number one A, we've talked about several things here. We've talked about several things we've talked about. We defined what integrity is, we defined what objectivity is, we defined what um, independence is. We said that the three are related. Then we went on to explain independence, the two dimensions of independence, which is independence in fact, in fact an independence in appearance, which simply means that the auditor must be independent and must also be seen to be independent. We also talked about um, the threat to independence. We highlighted on the familiarity threat. We saw a family member who was a finance controller of another client. We asked ourselves if the partner that has been accused there is a reporting partner, and in the text it didn't seem like, right? So we said that independence in fact is okay, but what about independence and appearance? We said that even though independence, in fact, seemed okay because the partner was not a reporting partner or did not audit the audit clients in question, the public's perception of the firm would be wrong, would be bad because and if they would still feel like the firm was not independent, right? And that's independence and appearance. And we also went ahead to talk about the resolution and whether the resolution makes sense, et cetera, among other key issues. I hope this is clear. And if you have any questions on this, please drop them in the comment section. B, your audit client, Esue Yabua, has recently hired an internal auditor to deal with the increased regulatory requirements. Afrakoma, the CEO of Esue Yabua, has indicated that she believed the presence of the internal audit would dramatically reduce the work that the audit firm will have to perform. She anticipates this will have an impact on the audit fee. Require draft, draft a report. So sometimes in these audit exams, you see reports. Draft a, so you have to know how to write a report. Draft a report um, indicating factors that will influence the extent to which the external auditors will rely on the internal auditors' work as per the requirements imposed by ISC 610, using the work of internal auditors. So anytime you hear reports, you should know that this is the, the structure. To, from, date, title, or subject. To, from, date, title. So to who? Who are you writing the letter to? So in this case, it's the CEO. From who? From the audit senior or audit manager, whoever it is. Then the dates, then you write the dates of your exam, or you 
if they give you a date in here, you use that. Then the title. So the title here could be a report on factors that um, determine the external auditor's reliance on the internal auditor's work. So this question is around ISC 16, which is the external auditor using the work of the internal auditor. All right. So let's look at let's look at some of the factors that will influence the external auditor's reliance on the internal auditor's rely, rely the external auditor's reliance on the work of internal auditors. Now let's look at some key things here. Let's look at some key. So factors that there are some factors that may affect the external auditor's determination of whether the work of the auditors is likely to be adequate for the audit. Right. So external auditor doesn't just wake up and starts using the work of the external, the internal auditors. They don't just do that. Now, very, very important. Now look at the now look at the um, mark allocated. It's 10, 10 marks, right? 10 marks. So you have to give about, let's see, five points and explain them or even more and explain them, right? So let's look at some of the factors, right? The factors would be, what are some of the factors that will influence the extent? Number one, factor is objectivity. Number two is, do you care? Number three is technical competence. Number four is communication. Number five is um, integrity. So these are examples of factors. So if you pick, let's say, technical competence, right? You have to come and explain. Before the external auditor will use the work of the internal auditor, the internal auditors must be members of relevant professional bodies and must and must check if and must also check if you know these internal auditors have the technical training, the technical training required, the technical training required. You know, so before you go and use the work of the internal auditor, you must be sure that. You know, they are well-trained, they are competent, and they are even members of relevant professional bodies. So that's a factor. When you pick, let's say, do you care? You'd want to know if the work, you know, the activities of the internal audit function are properly organized, right? Are the activities of the internal audit function properly organized? Do they have adequate documentation when it comes to their internal audits. So that's also another point. Um, now, when we talk about objectivity as well, which is also another factor, we want to know if the internal auditors are free from any conflicting responsibilities. And is there any kind of conflicting responsibilities? Um, another Thing that we can explain when it comes to objectivity is, you know, is the auditor, uh, does the auditor um, have any, you know, does the auditor have any constraints or restrictions placed on the internal audit function by management, right? So these are all things. These are all things that you can use to explain when it comes to objectivity. These are all things you can use to explain when it comes to objectivity. And then I also raised another point around um, communication, communication, you know, communication. So for the external auditor to use the work of internal auditors, obviously there must be some communication. So one of the things you need to ask yourself, are there proper meetings held throughout the period? 
between the external auditor and the internal auditor. Does the external auditor have access to internal audit reports, right? And is there that kind of communication and collaboration between the two? So these are some of the factors and how I'll go about explaining them. Yeah, so if you have any questions around this, please let me know. And then we'll move on to question number two. Question number two. Question number two. So here it says, Oliso. Oliso. Um, Private company limited has been operating in the manufacturing sector for over a decade. One of its major products is manufacturing equipment, which can reduce toxic emissions in the production of chemicals. Um, the company recently employed a new marketing manager who introduced a series of marketing initiatives. This has resulted in significant growth of the company since the appointment of the marketing manager. One of the initiatives is the warranties that the company gives it to its customers. The company guarantees its products for three years. And if problems arise within the period, it undertakes to fix them or provide a replacement. Hmm, interesting. You are the senior manager recently engaged by Integrity or the consult responsible for Liso Private Company Limited. You are performing the final review as required by ISA 520, which is analytical procedures. And I've come across the following issues, All right? So you have the receivable balance due from Obey Company Limited. Interesting. Oliso Private Company Limited has a material receivable balance due from a customer named Obey Company, Company Limited, right? During the year-end on year -end audit, your team reviewed the aging of this balance and found that no payments had been received from Obey Company Limited for over eight months. A little private company limited, however, will not allow this balance to be included in the list of balances to be circulated. Instead, management has assured your team that they will provide a written representation Confirming, confirming that the balance is recoverable. So, um, so that's it on the receivable balance. Now, when we move on to the warranty provision, when we move on to the warranty provision, it says the warranty provision included in the statement of financial position is material. It's material. The audit team has performed testing over the calculations and assumptions which are consistent with prior years. The team has requested a written representation from management confirming the basis and amount of the provision. Management is here to confirm acceptance of the need to issue this representation. Required. 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 Recommend three audit procedures to validate accounting estimates. Now, before I even, before I even um, look into this whole question, right? Before I look into this whole, before I look into this whole question, you need to understand that, you need to understand one thing around um, analytical procedures, analytical procedures. So first of all, let's explain what analytical procedures are even before we delve into the question, right? 
So when we talk about analytical procedures, what exactly are they? What exactly are they? When we talk about analytical procedures, what exactly are they? You know, this thing seems to be one of the things that really, really are important when it comes to um, audits. So it's important to understand it. So that's why I'm taking the pains to go through first, even before we dive into the question. So what are these analytical procedures? What are these analytical procedures? Very, very important. Very, very important. So when we talk about analytical procedures, they are basically um, procedures that are undertaken in an audit. Um, there are procedures that are taken in an audit to evaluate financial information and see the possible relationships between financial data. So one of the analytical procedures that are usually performed is inspection. So there are about seven of them. Now see if I can you know, explain all of them. So you have inspection, you have observation, you have external confirmation, you have re-performance, you have recalculations, you have analytics, you have inquiries, right? So inspection, observation, external confirmation, inquiry, re-performance, recalculations. Now, I don't need to explain all of that, but we'll see how um we'll see how we can discuss this in relation to this question. So let's recommend three audit procedures to validate accounting estimates, right? So what do you think? We've mentioned inquiry, we've mentioned inspection, we've mentioned observation, we've mentioned re-performance, we've mentioned recalculation, we've mentioned external confirmation, etc. So when it comes to, and it's always important to keep these, these points that I've mentioned, please keep them in your mind because I see this come over and over and over again, right? So when it comes to auditing accounting estimates, um, one of the key um, audit procedures used is inquiry. So you inquire from management how the accounting estimate is made and the data on which it is based. So inquiry is important, right? So that's one. If you look clearly here, it says recommend three audit procedures, but the marks given are five. So it means that you probably have to explain. So inquiry is one. Um, another one is review. Review, which I should have mentioned. Review. Please note this, please. Review. So review of the method of measurement used. How they measure this estimate. What kind of calculations do they make? Review it. And whatever assumptions went into the estimate the auditor should be able to assess the reasonableness of those assumptions. So that's number two. Number three, another audit procedure um, and that can be used here is um, what we call testing or testing the operating, or let me call it testing. So what do we test? We, in this case, we test the operating effectiveness around the operating, the operating effectiveness of the controls around the estimates. Right, so that's number three, testing. So we test the effectiveness of the controls. Test the operating effectiveness of the controls. Test the operating effectiveness of the controls. So that's number three. Now let me give an additional one just for, um, just for you know, your knowledge purposes, right? So another, another audit procedure is obtaining, um, obtaining what we call Obtaining what we call sufficient appropriate audit evidence. Obtaining sufficient appropriate evidence regarding what? Disclosures around estimates. What are the disclosures around estimates? That's very, very important. Another thing to obtain are written representations for management. So written representations for management. So these are all audit procedures that you can consider. For each of the two issues about evaluate the appropriateness of written representations as a form of audit evidence. You see, you mentioned written representations and you can clearly see it here. Evaluate the appropriateness of written representation as a form of audit evidence. So, so let's look at um, how to evaluate written representations. 
Let's look at how to evaluate um, the appropriateness of written representation. Let's look at the appropriateness of written representations. So what is a written representation? What is a written representation? First of all, let's understand what the term means, written representations. A written representation is simply a written statement by management that is provided to the auditor to confirm certain things. Right. It's also called a management representation. Right. So very, very important. Very, very important. Very, very important. So that's a written representation. So once you know that, once you know that, you can be able to understand exactly how, um, exactly how to approach it. So you have, um, you evaluate the appropriateness of written representation. How appropriate is, is this? So what is the whole purpose of written representation? It's to verify the valuation existence as well as the rights and obligations of a receivable balance, right? Now, if you hear valuation, existence, um, and things like that, you, what does your mind come to? Audit assertions, audit assertions, right? Audit assertions, and there are five, basically about five audit assertions, or if not more. So based on that as well, I'm trying to take you through all these concepts all at once. So um, audit assertions, you have, you have a number of them, right? You have a number of them. So I'll mention a few. Um, you have accuracy, you have completeness, you have appearance, you have rights and obligations, you have existence, you have valuation, etc. But when it comes to the receivable balance, when it comes to the receivable balance, um, typically look at valuation, existence, as well as rights and obligations. And I can explain why. Valuation, because you want to know the value of the receivable balance. Existence, because you want to know whether, you know, those receivables actually exist or they were just made up. Rights and obligations, you want to know who has the rights to that reasonable balance, right? Now, management has refused to allow the auditor to secularize the balance. And you know that there has been little activity around the accounts for the past eight months, right? So this is something to note. This is something to note. So how do we evaluate, um, evaluate this representation? Right? We need to know that this written representation will constitute entity-generated evidence. And this is less reliable than audit and repetitive evidence or evidence from an external source. No. So when a representation is coming from the entity itself or the company itself, it's what we call entity generated. It's from, money. It's from the company and it's less reliable than something that the auditor themselves, the auditor themselves generate. You know, very, very important. Very important. Very, very important. So if, if you are trying to understand this, you need to know the difference between entity generated evidence and auditor generated evidence there's a huge difference between the two so for entity generated evidence that's coming from the company evidence that's coming from the company auditor generated evidence is coming from the auditor right however if the systems or the controls are very very solid it increases the reliability of the evidence and if you know the evidence is written compared to being around then it also increases the reliability of the evidence So how do I, in evaluating this written presentation, first of all, you need to know that um, if you go to the question above, you need to know that, you need to know that when you look at materials, you see that um, the company will not allow this balance to be included in the list of balances to be deleted, right? So you can see something fishy going on here, right? Um, so my evaluation is that this is a weak form of evidence, right? It's a weak form of evidence because one, the company does not even want to be separated, right? So this is a weak form of evidence. And two, it's also entity, entity generated, right? Very, very important. Now, um, let's okay. describe two additional procedures that the auditor should perform to conclude on the balances to be included in the financial statement. Discuss two, two additional procedures to conclude on the balances. So um, you can mention many procedures here. First of all, you should have a management discussion. That's also a procedure. Management discussion. And in that management discussion, discussion you should ask why the secularization request was refused. So number one. Number two is review correspondence. So you need to review correspondence between pay company limited to assess the reasons for the non-payment. So you need to review any documents in relation to obey company limited as to why the exactly are not paid. Number two, you also need to review board minutes and legal correspondence to see if any legal action has been taken. 
number number four you can also um consider any impacts it will have on the financial statement if this balance is materially stipulated so basically if i'm summarizing the additional procedures i've mentioned many but your add additional procedure should center around um, management discussion reviews and any potential impact on the financial statements right so so this is how I but there are lots of additional procedures which i've already mentioned so this is where i'll bring today's lecture and i'll continue the series if you have any questions around it um, please don't hesitate to leave a comment thank you and have a good day bye-bye Thank mm -hmm. you.